How did the universe begin? How did the first galaxies form? And how did life emerge? These fundamental questions are at the core of a new mission called SphereX, a space telescope that will study the deep sky in the hope of unlocking some of the secrets of the cosmos. This episode, I got to speak to Dr. Jamie Bach, who is leading the investigation to find out more. I'm Jamie Bach. I'm a professor of physics at the California Institute of Technology and a senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Thanks very much for speaking to me today, Jamie. Um, and the reason that our paths have crossed is because I've been, we've been looking at the um, Sphere X um, mission, which um, you're a part of, obviously. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering if we could just start off the podcast by you sort of introducing Sphere X and a little bit about, perhaps a little bit about um, how the mission came about and how you became involved in it. Sure. Um, uh, recently, SphereX passed into what is called uh, Phase C. So there was a, a, a press release about that. Um, and so that's the phase now where we get to go ahead and, and build hardware. The project has been in development for uh, a number of years. But let me just say a little bit about what SphereX does. It's a, it's a relatively small astrophysics mission, and, uh, but aspires to answer some big questions. Um, and so our, the three questions that we're trying to address is how the universe began, how did galaxies begin, and what were the conditions for life outside the solar system? So um, those are big, important questions. But let me say a little bit about what, what we actually do. So SphereX will take uh, spectra over the full sky. So we're going to map the full sky at near-infrared wavelengths. Um, those wavelengths start from about three quarters of a micron, just, just where your eyes end in the visible part of the spectrum, and goes out to uh, five microns. And we split up the light into small channels. So each channel, the, the resolution varies a bit, but it's something like 1% to 3% of the wavelength we can see. Um, so that's fairly low resolution spectroscopy. And um, we map the sky at all these wavelengths. And at the end of every six months, we have a full spectral map of, 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 the, of the sky. So that's a, a new capability um, in astronomy. It's the first mission of its type. And so we have an enormous amount of, of spectra that are produced this way. Now, let me just say a little bit about the three questions. And I'll start with what's perhaps the easiest one to um, think about, which is what were the conditions for life outside the solar system? So uh, if we look at the Earth, um, which is our one data point for how life came about, um, life on Earth is very closely associated with liquid water. Um, I've actually done some experiments on the plateau in Antarctica where there is no liquid water and there's no visible signs of life up there. And you can contrast that with um, what goes on at the edge of the continent when you're near the oceans, where there's lots of, of, of sea life. Um, and so how did that water get to the Earth? Well, um, we think that those the materials for, for, for water um, were actually born in the interstellar medium. Um, and that water came somehow through the evolution of the solar system into the inner planets and eventually formed the oceans um, that constitute the Earth. And if we go back and look how water forms in, um, in the interstellar medium, um, in dense molecular clouds where stars are born, uh, the vast majority of that water is actually in the form of ice um, that forms on the uh, mantles of, of dust grains. It's not in the form of liquid, certainly, and it's not in the form of vapor. And uh, it's not just water that forms on those dust grains. Um, there are other materials, um, uh, many of them containing um, organic material, such as uh, carbon dioxide or methanol. And um, we can look at the abundance of, the, of those materials by doing um, spectroscopy on them. So basically, we can have a background star and look at how those materials absorb. Um, and so this has been done for a handful of sources, but with SphereX, we can, we can basically do this over the full sky. So we expect to see um, the abundance of water and uh, other ice materials uh, over uh, 
at least 20,000 sources, but probably uh, millions. So that's going to be a, a, a real game changer. And the idea is we can see how, you know, ISIS start natively. And then when we look at some systems that are in the early stages of uh, star and planet formation, uh, we can see if those ice abundances or composition evolve um, as we go into the you know early stages when stars are forming and then when stars have a disk of material that starts to um, accrete and turn into planets. We'll even see some systems um, that are maybe going through a late bombardment phase like um, our, our solar system was doing, and perhaps that's one of the ways that these materials got into the inner solar system. It's it's really interesting hearing about the sort of um, abundance of of water um, that, that you're that you're talking about there, because when we sort of think about you know the, the search for signs of life in our own solar system, we we're searching for water, you know, in sort of for example the subsurface oceans of moons like Enceladus and Europa, and it it seems that there's there's quite a sort of limited limited data points as you as as you've said in our own solar system to find water, but in, within that interest, interstellar medium, it seems that water's water's actually really really abundant then. Indeed, right, uh, yes. And um, and in fact, as I said, it's mostly in the form of these ices. And there's only been a limited amount of, of, of work done with some previous infrared missions. So this is like the first systematic survey of the abundance of the ice materials. Um, when you say that um, SphereX is going to look at the, the whole sky, um, do you, what do you actually mean by that? Do, do you mean like if I was to go at go outside tonight and, and look at the entire sky from my point of view, it would be like that? Or is it sort of, is it the, the entirety of the 360 degree view around the Earth? It's the entirety of the 360 degree view. Because we're in space, we're actually going around the Earth pole to pole uh, many times every day. Uh, we have access to the, to the entire sky. And so we'll create a 360 degree map, uh, a bit like Google Earth, but looking the other way um, in, in, in all these colors. And so, what's what sort of instruments does the um, does does the spacecraft have on board to to help you um, take take the data and then I suppose study it? Right. So, Spherix is a does does one thing. So, the you know the instrument, the whole concept was really developed by the the Spherix team, and um, it's a, a a very specialized uh, instrument to 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 do this in a rapid fashion. So it's uh, actually a fairly small telescope. We have a, only a 20 centimeter aperture, but um, don't let the small size fool you because we collect an enormous amount of light by having a huge field of view on the sky. So even though the aperture itself is small, the light gathering power is very large. And then we had to come up with some tricks to um, actually get the spectra in a, in a way that was um, both efficient and uh, not very expensive because this is a cost-capped mission. So we basically put a, a filter where the, the band pass varies over the filter just right on top of the detectors. This is actually a method that was developed for planetary science and uh, was not really known in astrophysics. I guess we knew about it, but we didn't. We rediscovered it. Uh, because in astrophysics, normally you want to put all your pixels on the one source that you're interested in. Um, and, and, you know, if you have pixels that aren't viewing that source, they're kind of wasted. Uh, but in this case, really, the, the source of interest is the full sky. So you can, you can do that. Um, and so then the trick is we have to take a bunch of pictures to kind of build up a complete spectra for every given, um, every given object. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I suppose also um, when you think about looking for water and, and signs of life beyond the solar system elsewhere in the, in the galaxy and the universe, um, you also think of exoplanets? I mean, is, is, is the study of exoplanets part of the uh, SphereX plan? Right. Well, because we're in a small telescope, we can't really, you know, resolve individual objects very well. We don't have the you know, supervision of something like Hubble or uh, a large telescope. There are some unique things we would do in that. It's, it turns out when studying exoplanets, if you're trying to understand the, the mass and the radius of the, the exoplanet, one of the biggest uncertainties is actually the property of the host star. So um, with, with Spherix, we'll measure the properties of all these host stars. And so that actually will help uh, quite a bit understanding the, the, the properties of the exoplanets in detail. Let me just move along here, if, if you like, to the um, other science goals that, that we're going to uh, address. So the, the, the next one, as we move further 
out is to understand how galaxies formed. And um, again, because they have a small telescope, we're going to do this in a unique way. Um, we're, we're, we're studying something called the extragalactic background light. And it's the reason the, the night sky isn't perfectly dark. Um, it also isn't, you know, there's this paradox going, going way back called Olber's paradox, which is why isn't the night sky the brightness of a star? Because if the universe were static, you would always see the surface of a star eventually. And the answer to that paradox is, you know, the universe isn't static and infinite. It has a finite lifetime. So the universe has a glow that's left over from all the light produced by um, galaxies over cosmic time. And so studying this um, glow is a way to see if we're catching all the, the light because we get all the light produced over the history of the universe. We're doing this in a specialized way. So instead of just seeing the total brightness, we use the fact that the galaxies cluster together. So there's kind of a spatial variation in this background glow. Um, and so by measuring the glow in multiple colors, we can see the total light produced by galaxies and then take it apart and look at how the galaxies formed over, over history. So we think the first galaxies turned on you know, several hundred million years after the Big Bang, and they formed out of primordial hydrogen and helium. Maybe star formation was somewhat different at that time. And this is a period that we'd like to know more about. There isn't a lot of data yet, but it has distinctive signatures because of the fact that it's born in primordial hydrogen and helium. When these galaxies turn on, the stars turn on, the photons, the ultraviolet photons from the stars actually ionize all the hydrogen and helium uh, between galaxies. So the universe today, all that hydrogen and helium is almost perfectly ionized. But this early epoch, that was not the case. So, you know, we're hoping that we can go and see if we can detect this early epoch and then say more about the formation of, of, of galaxies that way. Yeah, that's one of the really interesting things I always find about um, these um, missions that are sort of looking back towards um, deeper and deeper into the universe, because you're, you're sort of ultimately looking back in time, aren't you? That's right, yes. Uh, we, we, we get to be historians as, uh, as cosmologists. Um, the, you know, most of the galaxies we can see with a telescope in your backyard are, are incredibly far away, but they're not that far away in, in a cosmological sense. Um, you know, the, 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 the furthest galaxies back would be, you know, 13 billion light years back looking into the past. And, um, you know, we know as we look further in the past, we see galaxies evolve. They, they, they change in time. And um, this, you know, first epoch of galaxies, there's really not a lot of, of data, but... Um, you know, it's, it's, therefore, it's going to be very interesting to see what we can say about that. Yeah, just just how far back could you look? I mean, it, I, I take it it's not really actually possible to to go back and see sort of seconds after the Big Bang, is it? Uh, so, I should emphasize this is kind of an indirect measurement. We see the you know the the glow of many galaxies all put together. So we're not seeing the individual objects. We're kind of seeing the the galactic ensemble uh, that way. Um, and, you know, bigger telescopes have to go and look at the individual galaxies. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is we can take those measurements of individual galaxies that have been done by, by generations of astronomers and see if that really matches up with what we get when we look at the total light emitted. Because it's possible that total light came from very faint or diffuse sources that would be missed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things um, when I was sort of um, reading about Sphere X is that one of the terms that kept coming up is uh, inflation. I was wondering if you could explain what, what that's about and, and the, the, the role that plays in the, in, the, in the mission. Right. So that's our third science goal, to understand how the universe began. Um, and so, you know, current cosmological theory says the universe was born in this hot Big Bang. Um, and then in the 1980s or so, um, theoretical cosmologists started to get uncomfortable with that picture because there were certain things that couldn't quite um, explain. So one is, is, you know, why is the universe approximately flat geometrically? 
And um, why is it as smooth as we see it? Because if you take Einstein's equations, um, the universe pretty quickly would depart, you know, if, it, if its initial conditions were a little bit not flat, for example, um, today it would be, you know, very far from flat, but yet we see something that is close to flat. So uh, this, the, the theory that came up to explain this is something called inflation, which is that the universe goes through this really violent, rapid, exponential expansion in the earliest moments. Um, we're talking here like times of a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And in this expansion, space expands so violently, uh, you can think of it like space expands faster than the speed of light. In other words, if there were two people, two objects in communication, the space between them would expand so rapidly that they would actually go out of communication. And um, so this, this idea of inflation is consistent with Einstein's equations. So there's no paradox here that you can have inflation to do, do this, you know, space expand faster than the speed of light. Um, although it sounds very counterintuitive. The, the, the other thing that this does is it explains like why the universe is so homogeneous because the patches of the universe we see uh, weren't independent. They were all in contact at this early time before inflation happened and then took that little region and spread it out. It explains why the universe, the geometry is roughly flat because, um, you know, any intrinsic geometry gets blown way up. It's like why the surface of the earth now looks up flat, you know, because it's been stretched so much. Um, when, when you look locally, it looks, it looks flat, even though it might have some other geometry. So the, the, the trick here is, is that the mechanism that drives inflation isn't uh, understood. It's happening at energies that there's no laws of physics that we can use. It's beyond the energies that you find in the st standard model in particle physics. So the, the, the physics that cause inflation are, uh, I guess you'd call them ph phenomenological. We need to fill in what did that. Uh, in other words, you can get this effect in Einstein's equations if you change the matter energy part. So uh, we think of matter as being gravitationally attractive, but it can also have a pressure. Light can have a, a, a pressure, for example. And if that pressure were negative instead of positive, uh, it can cause this kind of expansion. It's perfectly fine with Einstein's equations again, but you need some kind of uh, unusual substance to, to do it. This all sort of um, reminds me of the, 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 the sort of problems experienced with things like um, dark energy and dark matter. Is it, is, is it, is it in that sort of um, realm of, of, of sort of trying to understand the, these, these unknown, unknown quantities and, and forces in the universe? Well, it's a bit like dark energy. Our dark energy has the same signature in that, you know, it well, it causes the expansion to accelerate, you know, and uh, today that appears to be happening, thankfully, a much more gradual process than at the beginning. Um, but, the, but the basic idea is the same. And of course, we're trying to find out what con constitutes uh, dark energy. Um, at these early times, as I said, you know, we don't have really the framework to, to probe the physics. So our, our best uh, measurements to, to date will probably be the universe itself. Inflation also has some pretty profound implications. One of them is, is that the, the noise that happened at the time of inflation is really driven by quantum mechanics. So the quantum mechanical noise then got stretched out to these large scales. So the galaxies and clusters of galaxies we see today really had this quantum mechanical source uh, a, a birth. And uh, that's you know, a fantastic idea that the largest things we see today are connected to the very smallest, um, the very smallest things. Uh, the other implication is that the observable universe, which is incredibly vast, um, you know, that, that, that got expanded by inflation, but we don't know how big the universe was at the time that inflation happened. And it's 
very likely that the you know the universe itself goes beyond what we can see by many many orders of magnitude. So not only um, you know is the sun not the center of the universe, but we can't even see the entire universe by by a long stretch. Um, it's kind of the ultimate Copernican revolution. Um, uh, so you know I th- I think this is all fascinating, but I'd really like to get some measurements uh, to, to, to learn more about this. And that's where spherics uh, comes in. So there, it's, you know, probing inflation at these very early times. I mean, we can't even see the light uh, that was present in the universe at that time. It's not possible. So we have to use indirect measurements to learn more about inflation. Um, and so inflation was obviously a big event. And these quantum mechanical fluctuations that got blown up to enormous scales by inflation kind of set up the seeds for galaxy formation to proceed. And so one way to study inflation is to actually look at how galaxies are distributed today. If we go look at the very largest scales, um, that initial set of fluctuations should still be visible in in the pattern of how galaxies um, are, are distributed. So with our spectroscopic power here with um, spherics, we plot the positions of, of all these galaxies, hundreds of millions of galaxies, and their distribution is sensitive to these initial conditions that were set up by inflation. So we can work backwards from that distribution and say more uh, about, you know, what were the basic properties of inflation. So in particular... The question we're looking at was inflation kind of simple and driven by a single field, you know, single energy source, um, or, or were there multiple fields? And so the statistical distribution of these galaxies can help us answer that question. To me, it sounds like when, when you describe each, each of those three um, threads that um, 3X is going to be studying, it sounds to me like any one of those alone could be justification for a mission and an entire science team. Um, is, it, is it a challenge to, to, to sort of have one mission and, and one team, d- you know, dedicated to those three incredible and, 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 wi- and far-reaching questions? Well, we're, you know, we're, we're fortunate. Uh, it's, we're blessed and cursed with, uh, with uh, all, all the scientific richness. Um, it was kind of one of these amazing things where we had when, when, the, when the mission was born, there was a, a study group and, you know, there are a bunch of ideas that were put, you know, kicked around. And um, it's just an amazing coincidence, if you like, that there were these three themes that were very closely related, could all be done kind of with the same, um, same capabilities. So, you know, that, that was really exciting. But yes, handling all the Data and you know these are these are difficult problems. They need to be done really carefully. Uh, that is a that is a challenge because Spherics is one of these missions with a with a strict cost cap. So we have to cram all this analysis into you know the available resources. So what's next for the mission then? You are what's left to prepare and when's it going to launch? Yeah. So uh, the way NASA develops missions is we go through a set of phases. As I alluded, uh, you know it starts out with a competitive study phase, so it's called phase A. We went through that and compete with other missions and NASA picks one of them. Um, Then there's a more detailed study phase. Of course, the development time is pretty short. So in that study phase, we have to order, you know, long lead time items like the detectors and the telescope and and, 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 and complete our study at the same time. Um, And now we've made the transition from that second study phase B into um, phase C, which is when we get to build the and test the, 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 the instrument and procure the spacecraft. And then after that, um, so that, that phase lasts about two years. And then after that, we integrate with the spacecraft, which is provided by Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and then we go out and launch. Um, the schedule's been uh, a little... Uh, unpredictable, of course, with 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 COVID, but we're aiming for a, a mid twenty twenty four launch. Um, so it's all pretty quick in terms of the 
the development of a, of a space mission. Uh, after launch, Spherix will observe the sky for at least two years, which gives us four complete maps. Um, and uh, it'll be a fire hose uh, of, of, of data <laughs> that comes with that. I mean, it's not just the, the three science themes that I mentioned either. Um, we have to, we will pr be producing these, you know, unique spectral maps for the entire science community that get to pour over the data. And because it's a new thing, there's going to be lots of rich and interesting um, science in, in, in that data as well. I think a, I think a lot of people, um, when you say sort of a, a, an all an all sky map, um, a mission like that, pe pe a lot of people might might think of the sort of the uh, the map of the Milky Way, you know, um, created by the uh, the Gaia mission. Can, can we expect sort of like beautiful, spectacular imagery like that from from SphereX? Uh, yeah, so we'll we'll have um, all sky maps like that, but in 102 colors. Um, they won't have the you know fine resolution of Gaia, but they'll have this unique. Uh, spectroscopy to it. And, you know, there'll be lots of things that um, astronomers can do that. I mentioned this application of studying the star host stars of um, uh, exoplanet systems, um, but also, you know, there'll be um, hundreds of millions of galaxies to, 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 to study in spectra, and especially anything you can do with multiple types and combine them together. There's a, a huge statistical database there. Um, we, you know, for example, um, some galaxies have host massive black holes. Uh, they're called uh, quasars, and we don't know how far out quasars exist. Um, they go out to uh, at least a redshift of seven, um, but they're very rare. And uh, so there's a few that we know that are that far away. But by covering the whole sky with spectra, those kinds of objects would would pop out in the in the spherics data set. And it just goes on and on like that. We've had several workshops where astronomers have come and presented ideas, and, and you know, every one of these workshops and kind of blown away by the creativity of the community and all the other things that could be, uh, you know. So it's good. One of the things we have to worry about is just there's an incredible temptation to go into the the archive and, and play around, but you know we've got a job to do. So the science team has to focus on that. Well, it sounds like it's going to be. Um... An absolutely fascinating uh, uh, mission with with plenty of science to to discover for us those decades to come. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to wish you all the best with the rest of the mission and, and good luck and um, you know for launch and everything like that. And uh, also you know thanks thanks very much for speaking to me today. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.